morning. And on our second service, our opening prayer will be uh, Brother Larry Kennedy, and our closing prayer will be uh, Jimmy Hendricks. Go over uh, a couple of announcements. There are men's sign-up sheets that are still out, still on the back. If anyone had to fill them out, please, please fill those out. And uh, for our ladies' fund, if you'd like to give money to that, please give your money to Karen Lott. And as always, remember our camp for camp drive. On our prayer list this morning, we want to remember our nation and our military. And uh, Mary Rexstraw, Brenda Morgan, Christy Tucker, Larry Kennedy, Truman Ballard, Amanda Lott, Joyce. Espino, Gene Hendricks, and Melissa Bose, and Stella Fox. On our read list this morning, we have uh, Buddy Robinson, the Buddy Robinson family, the Charles Staggs family, and Patsy Ryan family. We need to remember all these in our prayers. We won't see any birthdays coming up for this week. We do have an anniversary. It'll be uh, G uh, Jimmy and Jean Hendricks on the 28th. Uh, that's all I have to announce this morning. If you have anything, get it to me, and I'll announce it in a second, sir. Morning. I'll be reading Romans 6 21 through 23. King James Bible. What fruit had ye then, and those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit to holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and all that many wonderful blessings. We just want to thank you for blessing us with another beautiful day on this earth, Lord. So we ask you to be with Sean today as he brings us your word and supplies for everybody wants to buy, Lord. We ask you to be with all the ones that's on the sick prayer list. And also be with the ones that's on the bereaved list. And be with them and know that you don't care. Uh, Lord, we ask you to be with us for the rest of this day, Lord. We're still in prayer. always wanted to be boy lamp light. <clears throat> I'm on the way the bright and shiny way I'm in the glory land
if they've never played or, or have no interest in playing golf. And we won't want to give a book to someone who hardly ever even reads a book. We won't want to give a hairbrush to somebody who doesn't have any hair, right? So no matter what the occasion is, we try to match the gift as best we can with the needs, the interests, the wants of the person who receives the gift. What would they like? What do they need? And that's why many people just give money, right? Or, or a gift card, because they really aren't sure. They really can't be sure what kind of gift that person would will really appreciate. But folks, God offers this gift because he knows we need it. He knows we need it. The first part of this verse, Romans 6, verse 23, tells us why we need it. Because the wages of sin is death. We need life. We need eternal life because we are destined for a spiritual death. Because we are sinners. Romans 3 and verse 23 says all of us are sinners. Now, when we talk to folks about that, and perhaps even when we think about sin, Ourselves, we kind of get a misconception of what that is. Oh, we, we've got some things in our mind that are obvious, right? And lying and stealing and killing and cheating and similar actions. And, and as long as, you know, in, in folks' mind, as long as I'm not partaking of those things, well, then I, I'm not sinning. We think of those things as sin. But the Bible says that we are all guilty of sin. We're all guilty. We all come short of what God would have us do. No matter how good we think we may be, God says it's not good enough. No matter how many good deeds we do, God says it's not enough. No matter how much we try to help those who are in need, God says it's not good enough. No matter how much we love our enemy, no matter how much we love our, our, our friends, God says it's not good enough. We have all fallen short of his standards. Isaiah 46 and, or 64 <coughs> and verse 6 for, says that we have all, we have all, let me see if I can get it pulled up here. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do things a leap in our iniquities, our sins, like the wind, have taken us away. <clears throat> we see basically what sin is by looking back at the account of Adam and Eve. God told man and woman not to eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? That if they did, as soon as they did, they would surely die. But the serpent tempted Eve. By telling her she would not surely die. But by eating of that fruit, she would be as wise as God, knowing good from evil. So the first couple, they disobeyed God because they wanted to be as God. They wanted to be like God. They wanted to know as much as God. They refused, in essence, to acknowledge God in his leadership of them. And that's what sin is ultimately. Sin wants us to, to, to be the ruler. Sin desires for us to be the master of our own life. Sin is the refusal to let God be in control. And Adam was told that if he obeyed, disobeyed him, he would surely die. Because that's what sin does. It, it separates us from God. We, we want to do what we want to do, right? And, and our main concern is in meeting our needs. Our desire to do our own thing results in those things we recognize as sin, if you think about it. The lying, cheating, the murder. That is all mankind wanting to be 
his own God. The desire makes us disobey God. And God says that the wages for this sin is death. That's what sin pays you. That word wages refers to the rations that a soldier in those days would receive for their activity. What we receive for sin is death. But there's some good news. God knew what we needed. God knew that we were destined for destruction. God knew that we needed just the opposite of the wage of sin. So what's the opposite of the wage of sin? Life. God offers us the gift that we need. All of us need life because the alternative is death. All of us need the gift of God that he has given to us. So the first thing that we need to look at is, of course, the fact that God offers us this gift. And the second thing is, what is that gift? Well, the second part of verse 23 tells us what that gift is, right? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's a flip side at the end of that coin, right? It begins, begins with some pretty bad news. But death doesn't have to be the final word. Death is the first part of that verse. The second part, the second part is the gift. We need that gift that God has offered us. So then here's the third question. And the one I want to focus on for the most uh, of the rest of this lesson. What are we going to do with that gift? What are we going to do with that gift that God has offered us? Isn't, it that, isn't that the great question? Every person needs to answer this question. And we need to answer it personally. We don't need to say, well, my wife and I, or my parents and I, or my children and I, because it is an individual answer that we're going to have to answer to. Romans 14 and verse 11 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess to God. And so then every one of us shall give an account of himself unto God. It's an individual thing that we need to answer. What am I going to do with that gift that's been offered? The sad truth is, most people will never decide what to do with that gift. And in that indecision, they have made that decision. That's why the world continues to be such a dangerous place. What are we going to do? What are we going to do with the gift that God has given us? We've seen that we all need it, right? We've seen that God understands and picks out that perfect gift for us. So what are we going to do with that gift? What do you do with any gift? First of all, hopefully, you receive it. We must receive the gift of God. A gift does you absolutely no good unless you receive it. If I have a gift for you, but you never received that gift, it does you no good. Now, we have a little running joke at our house that when the kids were little and Santa Claus would, would, would come every once in a while, he'd forget where he put some of those presents. And, and sometimes it would be months. We have had occasion where it was years that Santa Claus had accidentally dropped something off its sleigh and it wound up somewhere that we found a little later on. Didn't do any good for Santa to bring that gift if it never was received. You see, no matter how much we, we believe that we need or want this gift of God, we'll never have it until we receive it. We, we talk about, we sing about, we hold up banners of John 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world 
But he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Did you see what it says there? Whosoever believeth in him. God has a gift for everyone, but it stands to reason that a gift must be received. I have to stress that because there's people that they, we call universalists that honestly believe and teach that everybody is going to be saved because Jesus Christ came and died on that cross. Everybody, everybody's going to have that eternal life. Whether they receive that gift or not, that gift has been given to them. It's for everybody. Whether or not they receive it, it doesn't matter. That may be a comforting thought, but now that's, that's not what his word says. Jesus says that that's, that's not how it is. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 says, For us to enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. That goes a long, that's a long distance to try to make from universalist <laughs> ideas, isn't it? That, that's a long way to go from saying everybody's going to be saved. Jesus says, no, no, few there be that find it. Many will find destruction, but few, few will find salvation. Matthew chapter 7, down in verse 21. It's almost like you needed to emphasize that point because a lot of folks wouldn't get it, and frankly, they still don't get it. He says, Not everyone who saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. How do we know what God's will is? Well, through the Holy Spirit, we've got it given to us. Through the Holy Spirit, it has been given, it has been secured, it is documented, and it's what we're going to be judged by one day. So our, our goal, our goal, if it's heaven, needs to be by in reading the instructions we follow and receive that gift. No matter how many, how much we may want to think, everybody, everybody is going to have that gift of God and receive that gift of God. The word says that's just not accurate. One must receive that gift. So how do we do that? How do we receive that gift? And you know that opens up a whole other can of worms, doesn't it? There's a theology of Calvinism that, that's called the unconditional election. And it goes a little bit like this. God chooses certain individuals to be saved. Those, those elected receive mercy, while those who aren't elected, they receive justice without condition. According to this theory, according to this tenet, there's some who are denied the gift because God didn't choose them to have the faith, to have the power, to have the will to reach out and receive the gift. Does God offer the gift to, not, a gift to all or none? Or does he only offer that gift to just a few who chooses by destination, by predestination, to have that ability? Does that mean that God chooses only certain ones? Well, again, that's not what the Bible says. Romans chapter 2 and verse 11 says that there is, God is no respecter of persons. Verse 12 goes on and says, For as many who have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. As many who have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Does it say that there are just going to be a few? No. 
not just a few who's going to be given that grace to be able to take that salvation and others left in the cold. No, he's not a respecter of persons. And we've all been offered this gift. We all have the opportunity to accept, to receive that gift. But we've got to receive it. John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. To be able to accept that gift, we must accept Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 and 10, If thou shalt confess with my, thy mouth that the, the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man, uh, for the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Does that mean all that we have to do is confess before me? No. That, that's some of the things we've got to do to receive that gift. Eternal life, folks, that's the point. It's only found in Jesus Christ. Because he's the only one who rose from the dead. He's the only one that was the perfect sacrifice. He's the only one who conquered death and the grave. Why would I want to get eternal life? Why would I seek to get my eternal life from a, from a person or persons who are somewhere dead in the grave? Like Muhammad, like Buddha, whomever. Why would I seek life in, in someone who is dead? I can only get life from somebody who is alive. He had demonstrated he is life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He proved, he demonstrated that he was alive that morning on that third day after his crucifixion, and he rose. You ask me why I, I received the gift of eternal life? It's because he lives. Paul, when he wrote this verse, Romans 6 and verse 23, he was addressing folks in the church. He was addressing the church. He knew his readers had received that gift. They had received that gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And he didn't do all of this so we could sit here and be unsure. Folks, if we're here today and we're not 100% sure that we have received the gift of eternal life, we need to make sure. We need to go in his word. We need to, to look and see what it says that we must do to answer that very important question, what must I do to be saved? We understand in all other aspects of our life, if we get a paycheck, we go through and make sure that all the deductions are right, right? We, if we have a checking account, we want to make sure that all of those things are correct and not something that's fraudulent taking place or too much has been taken out. We understand that part of it, and we get that. But when it comes to the most important thing in this old wide world, we just take what's in our heart for it or what somebody tells us. The scriptures reveal Jesus Christ. They are they that testify to me, is what it says. We need to be sure. We can be sure. God didn't give us this gift. Jesus didn't come and be that perfect sacrifice and now on the cross so that we could be unsure. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That takes us to our next point. There's more to a gift than just receiving it, right? We usually are supposed to say, thank you. What do we say? That's the stuff we teach from a very early age. Now, what do we say? Thank you. We usually say, uh, thank you. We usually show appreciation for receiving a gift. What are we going to do with that wonderful gift? We've got to receive it. And then we need to respond to that gift too. How do we respond to the gift of life from God? God wants us to respond to the gift of life by growing to be more like Christ. 
If we're going to wear that name Christian, it needs to be who we are. We say thank you for the gift by using that gift. When we fail to use a gift that someone's given us, it makes them feel that, they, that we don't appreciate what we had done for them. And God has given us the gift of eternal life through obedience to his word. But what have we done with it? Have we used it? The gift of eternal life is more than a ticket to heaven. If it were just a ticket to heaven, why did God, through the Holy Spirit, give us so many things for us to do? Add to your faith virtue, the virtue of knowledge, knowledge, temperance. He's not speaking to sinners here, 1 Peter chapter 1 and 1 beginning. We are his workmanship created in Christ for good works, Ephesians 2 and verse 10. Be faithful unto death, Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. This is a principle that has held up since the beginning of man. God has always given man something to do. Genesis 2 and verse 15, the Lord took the man, put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. If Noah and his family, Noah, he looked through and saw that Noah was a, a just man, a good man. So if he knew that Noah was a good man, a just man, why did he have him build the ark? If Abraham was such a good person, a faithful ser person, a faithful servant, why did he have him leave his homeland? Why did he tell him to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice? If David was a man after God's own heart, why did he have to go through all the trials that he did with King Saul? Because God has always, always given us something to do. James says in James 2 verse 14, What is it profit of my brethren, though a man said he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked, destitute of uh, daily food, and one of you say to and depart in peace, be you warmed and filled, Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which they are needed for the body. What does it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead. Meaning alone. Do we appreciate that gift enough for it to change us? Do we appreciate that gift enough for Him to be seen through us? Do we appreciate that gift enough? For that gift to be our source of encouragement for each other. Do we appreciate that gift enough to be able to share that gift with others? I send the line to the songs that we sang this morning. And I appreciate uh, Michael for leading that song for me. Because that's one of the responses to that gift. That's one of the acts of appreciation for that gift. Share that good news with other people. I heard a fellow liking it like this one time. We know how dangerous and how deadly and how how horrible that this, this word cancer is for people, right? And we know a lot of people who have suffered with it. Their families have suffered with it. So let's just ask ourselves, what if, what if we had discovered, what if we had figured out as an individual some things that we could take that would remove that horrible disease from the lives of others. But we wouldn't tell other people about it. What kind of person do you think I'd be if I had that that gift? If I had that solution? If I had the, something that would cure that death? And I wouldn't share it. I wouldn't let others know about it. Folks, don't you think that that gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ is not a far greater gift than even that cure would be? So if I'm going to appreciate that gift, I need to share that gift with others. The bottom line is, we're going to be in eternity. With him, separated from that gift has been offered that gift has been extended but it's our choice to receive after we've 
walked a little here, while here with on earth, God's going to call us. Someday it's going to be a time where it's going to be over with. And we don't know how long that's going to be. But this I do know. If we can receive that gift by faith and obedience, we get to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. subject of the gospel call, won't you come as we stand together? Feel like the cross, Christ will meet you there, be it to cease for you. Lift up your voice, leave with him your care, and begin life.
Brasileira e Mulheres, do Brasil é do Exército Centro de Base, é do João Leonardo Brasil, é do João Leonardo Brasil. We pray that we're taking in a marriage that will be pleasing in our sight. In Christ's name we pray. Father in heaven, as we continue in partaking of the Lord's Supper, we pray that you will bless this cup that is truly divine, as it represents the blood of your Son and our Savior that was shed for our sins. We pray that you will take it in a manner that will be pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Thank you. 